It's my very great pleasure today, of course, to introduce my colleague and my friend, Carol Clark. Carol's a recently retired professor of music history and culture here at the U of T. I actually find it impossible to think about my own years here at the university without thinking of Carol. It's because I was lucky enough to co-teach a course, an interdisciplinary course on opera with Carol for five, six years, I don't know how long. And I have to say, for me, it was the most intellectually stimulating experience ever. And it was an awful lot of fun, it really was. We also managed to organize together, I think over 40 symposia on opera over the last few decades for the Canadian Opera Company and the Faculty of Music. And I just say all this because this is someone whose many talents, both scholarly and pedagogical, I've come to know very well. So back in 2018, I think it was, Carol spoke to us here at Senior College about Joseph Haydn, the 18th century inventor of the symphony and the string quartet, and, but she talked about him as a man of the theater. You may remember, don't know why you would, but anyway, in introducing her, I said that Carol Clark was a scholar who has almost single-handedly turned around the study of this, one of the most influential composers of Western classical music. She set about to bring what was, I'm being charitable, a very conservative Haydn scholarship group into the 21st century. We all know this sort of framework, right? She began in 2005 by editing the Cambridge Companion to Haydn, and this launched the reconsideration critically of this composer by placing him within the broader cultural context and the complex musical, but also political and social world in which he lived and created, and of course was first received by audiences. But it was with her book published by Cambridge University Press and provocatively called Haydn's Jews, Representation and Reception on the Operatic Stage. With this, she blew open the field in 2009. Even Maclean's magazine, Maclean's, this is university stuff, right? Maclean's understood its importance and declared in the headline of its articles on it, a Canadian uncovers the real Haydn. And so she did, well, if not the real Haydn, at least a very different one than the conservative, pious, if somewhat witty one that history had constructed. In both Vienna and Eisenstadt, where he lived, her Haydn observed the Jewish populations around him and portrayed various Jewish stereotypes in two of his early operas, and she spoke to us about that. Her investigation of the composer's evolving approach to ethnic representation on the stage helped deepen our understanding of both Haydn's own humanity and the development of opera as a cultural form. And since publishing that book, Carol took on the work of editing the Cambridge Haydn Encyclopedia, and I could go on, there are many articles. But today you're going to hear her tell us about, I was gonna say the culmination of her passion for this composer, the culmination so far. There's probably more to come, I don't know. It's her latest gift to both the field of Haydn studies and to our experience here uh, in Toronto of opera at the university and in the city. She'd always wanted to witness the North American premiere of Haydn's Orpheus opera. It's called L'Anima del Filosofo, The Soul of the Philosopher. Why? Well, there's a story behind this opera, an opera the composer himself never saw or heard performed. It was shut down in rehearsal, banned in 1791 in London, and the score sat silent in East European archives until 1951, when a young Maria Callas sang the role of Eurydice in Florence, Italy at the premiere. Then in May, 2023, so a year ago, Carol the musicologist turned into Carol the opera producer. And on what could very generously be called a shoestring budget, she brought together singers from the University of Toronto and members of the McGill Baroque Orchestra to bring her dream project to the stage before she retired. Today, she's going to tell us about this opera, about why it was banned, why she just had to see it performed in Canada, and then how she managed to do it. Please join me in welcoming Carol Clark to talk to us about Labors of Love, Resurrecting Haydn's Orfeo. Carol? Oh gosh, Linda, I could never ask for a better introduction than that. Thank you so, so much. Uh, yeah, we taught five iterations of our interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approaches to opera um, across a 10 year period because <laughs> the university doesn't let you teach them every year, right? <laughs> um, a, a 
couple of programs that we'll let circulate through the audience from the actual production that we did in May uh, uh, 2023. And uh, yes, it was the, the North American stage premiere of Haydn's Orfeo. Uh, many people didn't even know he had written an Orpheus, Orpheus opera. Uh, it was really called um, L'Anima del Philosopho. Um, sorry, I've got my, here we go. L'Anima del Philosopho, the soul of the philosopher. So um, Joseph Haydn's opera that was subtitled Orpheus et Eurydice, and it's in five acts. Normally, opera seria of this period would have been in three acts, but here we have a five-act opera to which I suggest uh, Carlo Francesco Badini, the librettist, is actually suggesting French sympathies with this uh, uh, format that he sets it in. So the soul of the philosopher, it's about a failed philosopher. This is a tragic ending to the Orpheus story, and uh, it's actually um, one that one that uh, has a long resonance. So I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience too much, but uh, the idea that there's Orpheus has several tropes uh, across the, the, the mythological traditions, that he's, his song is so powerful. He's such a musician that he can capture and, and tame wild beasts with the power of his voice. The other one that he's a, a master musician, not only of singing, but of, of instrumental music, the lyre playing, and, uh, and that this then became the master trope for the founding of opera. The idea that a character who in real life is a singer and musician makes it the perfect ideal uh, avenue for presenting uh, the operatic medium. So Orpheus operas are there at the founding of the history of opera starting around 1600. And in, over the years, there have been subsequent iterations of this, many that feature a happy ending because um, Haydn, or because uh, Orpheus can't be seen to fail in his mission. He might in myth and in storytelling, but on the operatic stage, you typically don't want your audience to leave the theater feeling in a sad mood, at least in the early iterations of the opera. So early on, even with Monteverdi, there's a, a rewriting of it because it's that's what being performed at the marriage of, of uh, uh, at the Mantuan court, and then they they need a happy ending. You can't have a tragic ending for an opera celebration or for a wedding celebration. So this this uh, you know whether to stay true to the myth or whether to stay true to operatic uh, history is what this opera wrestles with. And then the other one is the the actual lamentation that the, he's in the underworld, he's able to rescue his beloved and, and convince death, basically Pluto in the underworld, to release Yoridice so that she can actually uh, uh, come out and, uh, and have a second life with him. And of course, uh, he's given the proviso, don't look back at her when you walk out, don't look back, look forward. That's a kind of a trope for life even, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, the idea that uh, he does look back and she dies a second death and then she dies. And so love has to come in and, and save the day. But in the actual uh, mythological setting, certainly in Virgil's version from the Georgics, we have the Bacantes killing uh, the Thracian singer by ripping him to shreds, very violent, and cutting off his head and you know, literally destroying his body such that artistic representations in subsequent uh, uh, generations and this you know, pre-Raphaelite paintings depict this of the floating head, that's all that's left of Orpheus, and that his voice continues to babble along in death. And that's one of the reasons what we might remember Orpheus when we're out in nature and taking a walk and listening to a battling brook and saying, that's Orpheus. <laughs> so that the voice continues, that he's uh, forever with us. So now that's the typical kind of just general overview. But Haydn wrote 
to when he got this commission in he had asked been asked to write an opera in 1790 before taking his first trip to England but he then writes home once he's in London he's been there less than a week and he writes back to his uh, prince Prince Esterhazy and says is the new opera libretto that I am to compose is entitled Orfeo it's in five acts but I shall not receive it for a few days so he hasn't even yet got the libretto and uh, this is January, and he's supposedly looking to a premiere of late May, early June, so he's got to write it quickly. But it's supposed to be entirely different from that of Gluck's. And Gluck's opera is the one that, I don't know if any of you saw the recent uh, Opera Atelier production. It's one that they've done a few times with this last staging that they did in fall of 23. Um, actually, you know, we're praising love at the end. Amour is the one who, as a deus ex machina, comes down and said, we can't have a tragic opera ending. We're going to bring Orpheus back to life. And this is what they, and this is how they end their production. It's really a celebration of love. So now, just to give you a sense of how Haydn's is so different, I wanna play you just the last few minutes of the opera. And it's pretty astounding because this is an opera that ends not only with the destruction of Orpheus, he's killed, he's not ripped apart on stage. In fact, Haydn's in Bedini's libretto specifically says he's given a cup of poison. It's as if he has a Socrates-like death. Um, however, uh, that's not the end. There is then the Bacantes who are taken down and the whole thing ends in a storm. So this, this cataclysmic storm scene, it's a flood that washes all living life away. Now, when you think about opera that ends with total destruction at the end, you think Wagner. <laughs> the rain cycle, right? What's her demo on? The whole world is wiped out and that's it. We go, whoa, okay, water again to maybe put up the fire and cleanse us all. Uh, but Haydn did it first. <laughs> and that's the remarkable thing is nobody knows this. <laughs> so, or if you've done, they've not, they've not thought about it in the context of opera. Uh, and I actually, just, just as an aside, will say here, some of my research that I'm thinking about working further on this is to think about the history of the way we tell opera in that Gluck is featured so prominently in the writings of both Franz Liszt and Richard Wagner in the mid-19th century. They both are obsessed with Orpheus and in Gluck's setting of that, saying that this is a masterful opera in the way that it tells his story. Can you imagine if Wagner and Liszt had known Haydn's Orpheus, how we might have told the history of opera differently? Uh, and so, in fact, both Liszt and Wagner praise Haydn as a fabulous instrumental composer, but they don't have this particular opera to know. And the only operas that they would have known would have been the ones that would have been at the Esterhazy court, for whom, oh, by the 19th century, court opera is so passé, right? So this would have changed operatic history, I believe, had Haydn's opera been premiered in 1791 never reached the stage, went completely silent. So I want you to hear this ending, just to hear how revolutionary this music is for 1791. Can I get this to play?
use that again. Um, so in fact, um, that was a recording from Pinch Gut Opera in Sydney, Australia, uh, made about 10 years ago. And um, when I played this for our director and or suggested that this, I thought this was a really great recording. And he listened to it and he said, well, we will not have screaming at the end, <laughs> nor will we use the thunder plates that you heard, the kind of uh, uh, typical 18th century orchestra that will have a thunder plate that's just a rattling piece of metal uh, to create the thunder. He said, no, the music can do it on its own. However, he did add a sound, a big um, uh, uh, sound blow at the end that was kind of meant to be the winds of the of, of the receding floods. Anyway, um, so yeah, every director has to take their own tape on this, right? Now, it was shut down in rehearsal. Poor Haydn. He probably didn't really know what was going on. Remember, he's a German speaker in uh, London. He does have uh, Johann Peter Salomon, who is, is his kind of impresario there, who is a German speaker and knows the London music scene very well. So he's got somebody to be a translator to explain things to him. Um, but uh, Haydn's diary entries of this period are all in, in German. He's very, um, you know, that, that's his language. However, so it's never performed in his lifetime. And what this little piece we have here that's from his, uh, a biographical account from 1805 that says, um, my opera was declared contraband. The constabulary burst into the rehearsal room and in the name of king and parliament forbid the performance. Uh, they prevented the opera from being performed in the theater in the future even. And you, can, and you have a sense that this was politically too sensitive a topic to be performed. It has the potential to incite violence. It has the potential to show mob rule. It has the potential to resonate too closely with the French Revolution, which is going on precisely this time in, in, in France. And the British are very, and the, and the government, William Pitt's government, very concerned about the, the sense that, wow, this, this kind of crazy activity that's happening over in France cannot come across the channel and affect here. So there's a big clamp down on, on uh, representations of, of artistic products that might uh, be the clo too closely hewed to the kinds of things that are happening in France. And the, just to note, there's an opera right at this same time that is performed in France, Cherubini's Lodoisca, which has a volcano at the end of it, and it destroys the world. <laughs> um, so you have a sense that this was uh, understood as being problematic if you have nature uh, unleashing the forces of uh, possibility for destruction. So, so, and Haydn elsewhere even suggests that the music was confiscated from the desks of the music players in the rehearsal so that the parts were all taken and that his score was taken. So he did not have his opera. Uh, well, there's part of that. Anyway, there's just a, a little sense of how the rivalries in opera were really strong at this time. This is a picture, uh, a caricature from uh, 1791 that shows this battling of the opera houses. And this is typically used as the reason why this opera was banned in that the license to do theater, which had normally been with the Haymarket Theater, which is the group you see on the on your uh, right, uh, the Haymarket Theater was probably the one that would be the, uh, the place to do opera, the King's Theater, but they lost the license in the, in the winter of 1790 and it went to the Pantheon. Well, the reason was that in 1789, the Haymarket actually burned down. <laughs> so the theater had, had been destroyed, but the financial backers quickly re reconvened and built the theater up again, such that they did have an open, an open functioning opera house in that season that Haydn arrived in, in England. But the Pantheon still held the 
the, the license to do opera. So we see here the two managers of these two companies. Uh, the big burly guy is an Irishman by the name of O'Reilly, and the little guy is the manager of the Haymarket, his William Taylor. And the king is associated with Riley. You can see the king is being led by the nose by the queen, and George III is, um, is, is the financial backer at this point of the, of the Pantheon, where his, his son, um, uh, the Prince of Wales, is the backer of the new and modern and up-to-date uh, traditions that William Taylor, so we can see Sheridan there as well, and the, we have the, the Lord Chamberlain is actually supporting the king in the Pantheon, and we have the, um, the Lord Chancellor is the one supporting uh, the Haymarket. So rivalries have been strong. However, I suggest that it's even more, it's the political context and the ramifications of this opera and the way it was telling, uh, and that Bedini was responsible for writing an opera that could no longer be staged. Now, here's a page from the opera manuscript, uh, the autograph. This is in the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. And the, this is the page from the final chorus that you just heard. So, Ote Orale, right there. Uh, so this is Haydn's handwriting. Um, that score um, that was probably the one confiscated in rehearsal, ends up in Berlin. Um, it was probably uh, uh, either, either it had been confiscated or Bellini who had purchased it. He was the opera uh, house director, the manager of the opera house, the artistic director. He may have had the score too. Um, I have consulted this score in, the, um, uh, uh, in Berlin in the Staatsbibliothek and they have no record of the provenance of this score. They know that it arrived in their collection somewhere in the mid to later 19th century, uh, and that it got cataloged in 1920, but they have no idea how it arrived there. So what was ever confiscated in London made its way to Berlin. The other one, unbeknownst to anybody else, this appeared much later. This is a something called a Kleines Postpapier score. It's the copy of the autograph that's clearly done, it's done on English paper, it's an English copyist, and it has Haydn's handwriting in it to suggest that he weighed autograph collection, uh, corrections in this score. And this probably went back to, uh, to the, um, with him home. And he, he basically smuggled what was illegal material. <laughs> Out of the out of England and brought it home with him. Kleinus Postpapier. So this score, which I've also held in my hands in Vienna in Budapest, is about this size. It's the kind of thing you can put inside a coat pocket and smuggle it out, and nobody would know. So he was smart enough to have made a copy of the score before it went into rehearsal, such that he could save it for posterity. Uh, and and this one, it's these putting these two scores together that we're actually able to have a complete uh, score of the opera. Um, so when the opera was produced, when it had its premiere finally, it was bringing these scores from Budapest and and, uh, and Berlin together, and making an edition that shows Maria Callas. And this is her in 1951. She's 27 years old. She's creating the role of Yoridice. And she is, um, she is actually just starting to have her career rise. Six months later, she's hired on by Milan, and the La Scala in Milan, and her career takes off. There is a recording of the other opera that she did this season in Florence, which is uh, Verdi's Sicilian Vespers. And that is the very first recording in her complete operatic oeuvre recording sets. We have no recording of Haydn's Orfeo. <laughs> this is another tragedy and a silencing of Haydn's opera, a tragedy in that, can you imagine if record sellers had had this very first opera recorded by, by Callas? 
And it's the only role she ever created. And we don't have it. Now, it was for, I traced this whole story through Florence archives, and uh, she, um, she, they were prevented from airing this for broadcast because Universal Edition that was responsible for making the score for this production in Florence for the world premiere um, didn't create a proper edition. They basically were photographing her, yeah, photographing materials directly from the autograph that they had gotten probably surreptitiously from Budapest in Berlin. Remember, we're behind the Iron Curtain at this time. So they couldn't, ha they didn't have proper rights to actually allow broadcast or recording. Another tragedy. <laughs> um, then the, here's another one uh, the, with her Orfeo T. Tegesen, who was a, a Danish singer. And then we have the, um, the sets were done by Julio Coltellati, who was a kind of an early on in his career, and he did mostly Grecian style sets. And you can kind of see uh, the callus in her, her, you know, it looks like drapery of Grecian style costuming, right? Uh, on the right there is um, Boris Christoph, the uh, bass who sang her father in this production. So yes, the story has Orpheus Eurydice and the father figure, uh, Creante. And, and then we see here Erich Kleiber, who was the, uh, the Austrian conductor who uh, conducted the premiere. And he was well known as a Mozart interpreter. So you, we have a sense that even though they weren't thinking historically informed performance, they were actually getting the best kind of interpreter of this for the period. There was a 1950 recording that had stimulated some of this conversation, and that was done in Vienna. And the, and the Haydn Society from both Boston and Vienna, and when we say that, it's, that should ring alarm bells for H.C. Robbins Landon. He is the kind of young musicologist who is behind this, um, th this magical moment of let's make a recording of this Orpheus opera. And then they, they, so they released the recording in 1950 with the Vienna State Opera and a cast that's been assembled there. And then when they know that Florence has signed on to do this production, they produce new notes for this to accompany this edition. And uh, this little uh, extra pamphlet was prepared. Here's a copy of the program from the um, Florence premiere, and I show this because this is in our University of Toronto Library collection. It's over at the Faculty of Music. It's one of the rare surviving programs from this premiere because there were only two performances of this opera at its premiere. It was done in the Teatro della Pergola, and so when I was over in Florence, you can see me there standing in front of the theater. I'm so happy. And uh, uh, renovated in the early 19th century. So the theater that I was able to see is the way it would have looked when this opera was premiered. Uh, and it's actually interesting in that it has a rake stage and the audience is the one that sits flat. So kind of early theater style. This opera had lots of champions in the, in, after the Callas uh, uh, premiere. Uh, Joan Sutherland picked it up. And it's about, you know, wow, okay, I'm, I'm another diva of the next generation and I'm gonna sing the stuff that she did and I'm gonna sing it even better and stronger. And you know, So she did recordings of this and she performed it in Vienna and, and uh, Edinburgh at the uh, festival there in the 60s. And uh, she also did, um, there was a prominent New York uh, concert performance, i.e. not staged, not in the theater, but we're gonna give you the entire opera that you can hear. And then the one who took it on to the next level was um, Cecilia Bartoli. And she, um, she was the one who then said, okay, we need to really apply historically informed uh, performance practices in this. And so she was the one who, who decided to um, uh, work with Nicholas Harnenpour and together they did uh, performances in Vienna and Zurich. And then she teamed up with Christopher Hogwood to make this actual recording. And she chose this opera for her main stage 
debut at Covent Garden in London in 2001 because it was such a vehicle for her to show up her vocal talent and she knew she would do it with a work that few had heard. But you're following this callous Sutherland Bartoli trajectory, right? And uh, so they, uh, and I actually did the pre-concert lectures at Covent Garden. I, uh, I was so lucky there was a guy they contacted in Wales at University of Cardiff and he said, I can't do it, but I recommend who should. And so I got to go over there. That was fantastic to see that staging. Now, if there's a way that you can kill an opera through bad staging, that was it. <laughs> Jor Jorgen Flynn did a most incomprehensible staging. <laughs> And most critics panned it because they didn't understand what was going on. And the singing was beautiful. And uh, I did interview Christopher Hogwood who said, um, you know, I can't look up. Uh, he said, I can't look up at what's on the stage. I have to just conduct. And I know the singers just need me to give them directions, but I can't watch what's happening on stage. It's just so, uh, you know, uh, it's an abysmal failure on the stage. <laughs> and so that made it sleep yet again, right? So here we come to our production. And I have to say there are many here in the room and maybe online who are watching who helped to fund this. We went fundraising to do this. Um, it's hard to put on opera, even if you're doing it in the context of the University of Toronto where we have so many resources. We had a theater, I had a tech crew who were in-house. I had to pay them, but we had this space available. Um, and so we were able, with the help of many of you, and uh, I have to thank my husband as well, who was my chief fundraiser here. <laughs> um, we just said, you're going to do this. You're absolutely going to do this. Because uh, I know you just you know, can't imagine not, not bringing this opera to life. So we did it in uh, last uh, spring, and it's quite a saga, uh, which is kind of what I wanted to walk you through now. The, I, I worked a lot with my vocal colleagues and Russell Braun in particular, who helped me assemble who he thought would be a good cast of singers. He and I spoke and I said, look, do we have students who can sing any of these roles? And he said, well, the role of, ten, of, of Orpheus, you need a professional tenor for that. There's not a student who can sing this role. It's very, it's very commanding. Tenors... Uh, uh, need to be more mature to do this. So we had Asita Tenakun, who used to be in Toronto with Amplified Opera, and he's now living out in Vancouver. I contacted him a year in advance about doing this, and he said, there isn't one thing I would rather do than do this because it's perfect for my voice, and it gives me a chance to branch out from singing Don Ottavio and Ferrando in Mozart's uh, Posi Fan Tutte in Figaro that he, you know, he felt like this would help him expand his vocal repertory as well. Professional tenor, which means you lay on, lay on a whole new apparatus of equity artists and having to get uh, equity involved and having an equity rehearsal space and obey equity rules. Um, but it also meant that for all the students involved in the production, we had a professional tenor for whom they could watch and see, oh, wow, this is how you have to behave in rehearsal if you want to be a professional. So he raised the bar, he raised the tone for everything that we did in the rehearsal space. A uh, fabulous person to work with and a, um, uh, a ravishing singer. We have here then Lindsay McIntyre, doctoral student who is now graduated from our DMA in historical performance, doctoral musical arts in, in historical performance. And she was our Yuridice. Uh, here, Creonte was, that's the father, uh, Yuridice's father, Parker Clemens. Parker is uh, currently working outside of opera, although he does sing in the Tafel Music Baroque Orchestra's chamber choir. Uh, and, and he's, when, so Russell Braun said, look, this is a kid who has a great voice, but he was only ever to be on stage once during his master's program because of COVID. So he's not had stage experience that he, he could use. So if he signs on to be your creonte, uh, it'll be wonderful and it'll be a valuable experience for him as well. 
So he took two weeks of vacation from his job so that he could be with us during the rehearsal period. That's how committed these people were to this production. Uh, Maeve Palmer, the genio or underworld guy, the soprano, she, um, she gets to sing one ravishing aria and she brought down the house with it. <laughs> uh, I get choked up when you think about some of this stuff. It was just amazing what these young people put into this. She is still in our doctoral program and uh, just finishing up her DMA in, per in voice performance and pedagogy. Uh, and you can see here that, yeah, she, we, you know, how do you take an underworld Gorgon type figure and suggest that she's larger than life? Well, the music suggests she's larger than life. And here we, you know, our young director had her have multiple arms and, and legs and features around her so that she was a commanding force of the underworld, right? Um, and, uh, so a really imaginative staging there. Uh, here's our director, Nico Krell, um, young guy who, when I went to the professional world to say, who might we get as a director? Um, I had, and again, one of the things that had happened over um, the, uh, during COVID, when we got to watch a lot of opera online and see a lot of independent opera companies do their thing. And so I got acquainted with many more opera companies that were doing smaller and innovative things. And one of them was Heartbeat Opera in New York City. And I contacted their director through a friend, which was quite um, interesting. Anyway, Ethan Hurd said to me, well, I have a professional fee of 10,000 US dollars. And I said, well, I can't afford you. And he said, I know you can't. <laughs> and I said, so do you have any protégés, any people who you might recommend? And he said, oh, yes. Oh, yes. I've got a young director working with me right now who's only ever been an assistant on my productions, but he's craving for the opportunity to have his own experience. So when I contacted Nico, he said, so you're telling me, you're offering me no pay or limited pay, but you're telling me I can get to do my own production, that it's an Orpheus opera, and that for me, it's international, he said, sign me up. So Nico, who I, I, we hired him online, and he came to Toronto and just said, oh, I'm in a nice place. I'm at home. He, we put him up for two weeks at Massey College. He was in his glory over there. It was, yeah, we had a lot of university help in putting this together. Uh, Trinity College put up our orchestra, and uh, Massey put up our um, director. Then I went, so we need, and he said, but I really, really need you to get an imaginative uh, set and uh, creative uh, team with me. And, and so I went to Astrid Jansen on the right there. Um, Astrid Jansen, a well-known director in the Canadian context, but well-known international career as well. But she works for regular theater, but also for opera. And she said, opera is its own beast. And we need to do a better job of mentoring the next generation of, of opera directors or uh, of designers and whatever. And she said, I had a young apprentice over COVID. Can I bring her on to this? And so Abby, Abby S. Terrero, who just recently graduated from U of T theater department, um, came on to work with Astrid. So we had a real mentoring situation going on there as well, which was, was just terrific. Um, I told them they had $2,000 for costumes and sets. <laughs> and Astrid said, no problem. I'm a professional. We do what we, we work within our budget. Their budget came in. They had expended $1,997. <laughs> and here's Nico with the stage manager. Now, again, stage managers come with an equity uh, uh, um, license and they have a fee scale that they must have. And it's about $1,600 a week. And we were gonna need somebody for two weeks of rehearsal period plus one week of preparation. And I said, well, that's more than I would even pay my director. So, um, so how are we gonna do this? So we went to Metropolitan Toronto University which has a theater directing and uh, stage managing program and stream. And, uh, Kate Chubbs, 
who's there in the blue jeans, signed up. And she said, well, I might like to have an assistant. Uh, so yeah, she just said, pay me what you can as well. I'm doing this for the experience. And we brought in one of our course members who's a doctoral student at the Faculty of Music from Nigeria. His wife, Atule, used to be a theater director and a stage manager in, um, in Lagos, Nigeria. And she said, I, I can't get any work here. I'm here on my husband's student visa in Toronto. I can't get any work here, but I would dearly love to be involved and bring my expertise. Well, it was hard to know who was the assistant and who was the actual stage manager in this production, but uh, Kate did it and Atule was a fabulous assistant. And we gave her some work experience here in, in uh, Toronto. And now what would the stage look like? Well, basically we had, again, I told you we had $2,000 for, for sets and costumes. All the costumes were, everybody wore black, basically, except Orfeo and, and Yoridice. They, uh, they, they had new, new costumes. Everybody else was wearing things that came from Value Village and Goodwill and all of that kind of thing. Re, uh, altered and reconnected. Um, you know, they, they put together a, a, a wardrobe of, of uh, pieces. Uh, but the set basically was, we were trying to create a illusion of a space. Uh, and, and Astrid said, well, behind the stage at Macmillan Theater, there's all this lighting, lots of lighting material hanging up there. And I really want to take that lighting and drape it from the top. And, you know, suddenly the stage director came, to, or the technical director of the theater came to me and said, she wants to take a lot of stuff from backstage and put it on stage. And I said, she's the professional, let her do what she wants to do. So he said, well, I've never hung lights like this before. <laughs> the lights were hanging down as if to create a tree trunk. And then the stand, the light cart on which all these cables were there, were also rolled out on stage. And that became the funeral gear for Yoridice and her death. Um, and basically, Astrid said, well, I think it's pretty clever. If this is an opera about the extinguishing of enlightenment, I think we've done it. <laughs> Very clever. Here's our young music director, Dorian Vandy. Now, I first approached Dorian uh, in 2019 about doing this opera. He's a brand, he had recently arrived at McGill. He was new to Canada. And I, uh, I said, Dorian, um, uh, I'd like to meet you sometime. Montreal's not all that far away. And so we met at a conference in Boston in the fall of 2019, and I proposed this to him. Uh, I said, you and your orchestra, maybe, or maybe you'd like to conduct uh, this opera. And he said, oh, Carol, yes. And have you ever met anybody who this, you connect with right away and the fire in their eyes tells you that they mean it? Well, that was Dorian. Over coffee, he just said, we're going to do this. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to figure it out. He said, I am hired at McGill to teach instrumental music of the Baroque period. But he said, if I really do what I want to do, it's to um, conduct opera. I, I'm never happier than when I'm conducting. And for that, him, that means playing um, at the keyboard. Uh, so you can see Dorian here. Um, and so he, we had to cancel this plan in, in 2020 because we had thought about, you know, 2019, 2021, around in there. Uh, we couldn't do it then. So we tried to uh, imagine then when would be the next time. And when I told him that I was going to be retiring in 23, he said, well, then we have a deadline. We're going to do it. And uh, I could not have worked with a better musician for whom you know preparation of the parts and materials and um, and getting the players lined up, he was instrumental to pulling that all together. You'll see he's playing here at a. Uh, this is on the stage at Macmillan. He's on uh, a keyboard, um, and we had to use keyboards rather than uh, acoustic pianos in rehearsal because we are doing a four thirty pitch, not a four forty. So we had to have digital pianos that we could tune to the proper pitch that the orchestra was going to be playing at and that the singers could rehearse with. Uh, so uh, hence this. He's a Baroque violinist by profession. He just happens to be a 
damn good musician. I speak, comes by it honestly. His mother used to play with Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. <laughs> uh, here's uh, some members of the orchestra. And here you'll see the, uh, the double bass player and the clarinet player over here. Uh, they teamed up with one of the doctoral students from our chorus, and the three of them have written a special piece on being involved in this production and the, and, uh, the contributions to the symposium. And that's going to be published in a, uh, a forthcoming issue of 18th Century Music, um, published by Cambridge University Press. As you can see, there was mentoring at every level of this production. Our chorus director, Ivars Torrent uh, of Topol Music, he said, um, when I, I contacted the orchestra early on and said, look, I'm not sure if we're going to need some ringers. We might need some additional players. Dorian's not exactly sure how many we could get from Montreal. In the end, we had 18 musicians from Montreal. Um, but he said, I would like to know that we have access to some professional players or their students, if need be, when we come to Toronto. And so Ivar's heard caught wind of this and he said, so Carol, you're gonna be needing a chorus director. And I said, yes. And he said, this is an opera I've always wanted to get to know because it has 10 choruses. This is huge for an opera. And he said, I will never get to conduct this at Tuffle Music. However, can I train your chorus? And in the end, he handpicked every one of the 13 singers who made up the chorus and every one of them was from the University of Toronto and he knows those voices and sees them coming through the ranks. He said, of course, I'm looking for future members of the Topo Music Chorus too. So, so he was interested in that. And then Chris Fagan, who works with Opera Atelier routinely, uh, stepped in to help with the dress rehearsals, uh, not dress rehearsals, the actual rehearsals uh, in the uh, music studio at the Faculty of Music. And you'll see he and Dorian are both here because he's, Chris is playing throughout, and Dorian has got the chorus and the singers and the and everybody in the room, and every once in a while he's hopping up because he's then going to conduct, and then he goes right back to the keyboard again. Very versatile musician. Nikos established the tone for our rehearsal space, and he wrote this on the board at our very first rehearsal. We had we had twelve days of rehearsal, by the way. Normally, it would take three three full weeks, but we didn't have that. But he said, this space is sacred. Everything bring from a place of love. Step forward and step back and trust the leader. And I tell you, that embedded in everybody and such that when our, here we are, this is everybody here, we're missing one chorus member at this first rehearsal, but here's our team. And this got reproduced in the uh, University of Toronto newsletter that went out just the week before our production because they caught wind of it and said, yeah, we can do a little piece on you. Um, it didn't hurt that Maeve Palmer, who sang the role of Genio, is actually the daughter of the chief fundraiser at the University of Toronto. <laughs> uh, so, you know, her dad caught wind that he was gonna be doing this. And yes, I, we can get you a little publicity. Um, and yes, yeah, so we did have two sold out shows in McMillan, an opening night and a closing night. And so another, basically another thousand to 1100 people got to see this opera again. Uh, but the rehearsal, I cannot tell you how magical it was just because of everybody buying into this ethos and our young students working with a director who was only a few years older than them just and they found his ideas and his approach so enervating that they really just gave their all. We didn't, the one singer we wanted, and Russell Braun had signed up to be our Pluto. He sings of all of a one minute in this opera, <laughs> but the voice of Pluto in the underworld. And then Russell had to tell us, oh, I've got a job in Aix-en-Provence, so I'm gonna take that. <laughs> and so he just said, I can recommend a few other bases you might want to do, but Nico got the idea that if we could create an amphiboid voice of uh, Pluto, 
that we would not have to have a physical singer there, we wouldn't have to get another costume, that we could create the, the perception that, that death is in our midst. And so that's what we did. We went to the recording studio in the, in the basement of, um, of uh, the Faculty of Music and recorded the, the voice of um, Pluto. And then at the dress rehearsal, if Nico didn't say to Ganeo, who we see in the top, leaning over the precipice there, said, why don't you invoice it? It's as if the, the, your, your Pluto's voice is coming through you and it'll just be so weird and so awkward. And, and she did. So she's mouthing Pluto's words there as if she's the, uh, the interlocutor here. Um, and it, it, was, it was a crazy moment. I, I won't go into all the details of the logistics and the timeline other than to say it was a very short rehearsal per period. We had, uh, we basically did, you know, four days with acts one, two, three, and then four, five for one day. And that first weekend, we just stumbled through the whole thing, having only had one rehearsal day on each act. And then Nico made copious notes and sent them all out to the students and said, here's what you need to know when we reconvene again after Victoria Day Monday, because on Tuesday, we're in Macmillan Theater. So start to get your stuff down now. Uh, everybody arrived at the rehearsal with their music memorized, and those who didn't saw that Orpheus, who has a huge role, had memorized everything and never needed to look at his book in the rehearsal room. And let me tell you, everybody came to that second day rehearsal with everything off book. <laughs> uh, again, just the professionalism of raising the tone. Yes, I was the producer, but uh, that meant running for coffee, running errands, getting extension cords, uh, you name it, <laughs> uh, there. Uh, and then I just want to quickly just look at some of the three, ex so three little key moments, which I think really tell us a lot about the way um, Nico envisioned this. Because I told you that Jürgen Flim's production in London was so terrible that everybody hated it. Here, obviously, it's a kind of nebulous world setting. We're not sure where we are. But you can kind of see the tree outline here, the form. And you can see the, the what we then ultimately made as the the, the funeral beer for for Yuridice. and uh, just the um, this course at the opening of Act Three, which was just after intermission for us. So we did Acts One, Two, intermission three, four, five, and it came in to just under two hours. Um, this this morning course at the opening of the second part comes in 11 minutes long. Now that's a huge amount of, of chorus time and stage time. And um, what did Nico do but have every member of the chorus, 13 of them, he said, so we're gonna, we're actually gonna process and mourn here as a community said, I want you to think of someone you've lost recently, whether it's your grandmother or an aunt or a friend. And I want you to bring something that reminds you of them to bring and place on Yuridice's tomb at this performance. Well, people arrived with teddy bears, postcards, photographs, even in one case, two beat up playing cards. <laughs> I mean, very personalized offerings. And that was the first half of the chorus was everybody processing in to lay these down individually across the chorus, very meaningful for each and every one of them. And then the second part of the chorus, after, after Orfeo comes and mourns, we have the um, a second heart of half of the chorus, and I, you know, it's kind of like, and Dory and I are sitting there sometimes saying, well, some of these things go on for a very long time. We can make cuts. We don't mind cutting. And Nico said, no, 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 because this chorus is only, in the second half, is scored for women's voices only. 
The women are going to continue the mourning and lamenting as they often did in Greek culture. <laughs> We're going to continue that. However, Creonte has called them off to war. And I hope you looked at the little uh, video clip I had sent of the trailer where you actually get to hear some of uh, uh, Creonte's call to war. And here, all the men are going to leave stage to go off to fight now this battle. Uh, and that we have um, uh, 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 this moment of them retreating from the stage. So an 11 minute chorus actually was one that we could stage um, provocatively and interestingly, just by the way that uh, it fit with the drama. Um, I guess I didn't really explain too much about that plot, but you know, there's a sense at the beginning of the opera that uh, Eurydice has been married off or going to be betrothed to Eredeo, who is not someone she loves. So she's not, she's fleeing an arranged marriage basically at the beginning of the opera. Uh, then we have uh, Orpheus come out and rescue her from the beasts who have been pursuing her in the forest. And then uh, they go to see her father and he said, hmm, okay, here's the one you want to marry so you can marry for love. Uh, and yes, I will now um, sanction that ceremony. Uh, and then it, after that, uh, we have Eurydice being pursued by Eridaeus' henchmen who are saying, what do you mean? Uh, you're ours. And so they come to get her and it's in that moment of her being chased in the forest that she steps on the snake, the snake bites her and she dies. And so, you know, the henchmen are left to be kind of holding her as she dies. And when father catches word of this, he thinks, he doesn't know that she's been killed by a snake bite. He thinks that Eridaeus men have killed her. And so he calls for war. We're going off to war to, you know, get retribution for this murder of my daughter. And of course, things fall out of whack then. Nico said on the first day of rehearsal, this is an opera about powerful men getting what they want. Orpheus, the Creonte, the king and ruler, is going to go to war because that's how you fight battles when you're powerful. And the other one is Orpheus is going to get what he wants by going to the underworld and singing beautifully. And then he also stages a little scene in their love moment where he has Orpheus order DoorDash, a day takeout meal, which arrives in a plastic bag. <laughs> and the plastic bag then becomes a symbol that goes off and floats up into the air. And then we have a raining down of plastic bags at the end of the production to say, it's environmental degradation that humans have caused that's causing the world to flood. And last summer, we all know the earth was burning, right? It might burn again this summer. We have pollution and man-made causes of our current climate crisis. That's what Nico was trying to say here. And I think he, he had a vision for this opera, which was really quite magical. I would love him to have a larger budget to stage it again. <laughs> uh, here, just I want to play for you this uh, uh, chorus. And it's um, just to talk through just a little bit. This is, a, this is the chorus that opens the underworld. So the beginning of act four, we now down in the underworld and we're getting depictions of the restless dead. Those for who, whose souls are not at peace because they have not yet achieved final rest. This is where Haydn really brings in the Burke's aesthetics of the sublime and really has a kind of terror and grandeur that we hear particularly in the chorus of the Furies, which is the next chorus after this one. But this one in particular is very good at, at outlining Burt's notions of obscurity, uh, you know, unclarity, we can't really see or hear, uh, privation, that we're deprived of our full sight and senses and abilities to take in everything, so real darkness, and infinity infinity, that things will go on forever uh, in this, this transient state. And Haydn's musical setting really depicts this. 
Um, it's a somber andante in F minor. Um, it has this depiction of these unfathomable depths, uh, imitative entries in the orchestra and Ritornello. So I don't know if you can kind of see this, this entry here, and then the imitation down here, imitation down here, and then we get it uh, down in here. So real imitative entries, uh, and ex which kind of give this extension of expansiveness and reverberation even. And the repetition of the word my at the end of the chorus as it goes through the vocal registers, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, so the dis dissipation of that sound. And then the diminished seventh chord, some very loud moments and then subtle uh, dynamic um, change uh, for somberness. So this chorus really depicts this and this is where I'm going to exit this and get out of this and hope that we can play this little clip that will give you um, This is where I need to get out of this, Michael, again, to get to my slide presentation. Do you remember how we did that? Probably not then. Sorry. Finder here. Or this one. Can I do it here? Oops, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. Hmm. <laughs> this is what we were trying to get at before. Exit. 
Yeah. Yeah. So which is ah uh, yeah, like quick time, yeah. This is so easy to do if you're not hooked to Zoom, right? <laughs> if you're tethered to Zoom, this becomes a little more difficult. Here we go. Great. Okay. Um, and just briefly now, uh, yeah, the next uh, slide presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And then this, um, just a, a imitative entries at the beginning of that course. Just very briefly, the other scene that was kind of interesting that Nico had really thought about a lot, uh, again, was simply a piece of silk cloth. The silk cloth that was to represent um, Yodadice's death and the, the it, pulling it through her toes such that she took that silk scarf and eventually by the end of the aria had wrapped it all around her as if she really was dead then. The venom had seeped through her body. Haydn writes this, this uh, aria with lots of breathlessness. It's got lots of rests. And um, I've, I've had a couple of people who are, you know, really work a lot on operas that they know Callas sang, and they said she really loved a good death scene. So you can imagine her really getting into the fact that this is a breathless aria and that you can emote as much as possible. And it's written in there. Haydn has provided rests for you to take as much time as you want to then gather your strength for saying the next line. Uh, and so that suddenly, slower and slower, you would be eb life ebbing out of you. Um, and so uh, uh, our, our Lindsay here did a great job. And then that same scarf is the one that she walks out of in the underworld when she's summoned to see um, uh, uh, Orpheus. And we see them down here having, she has released, so she comes out with the, with the scarf fluttering across the stage, she reveals herself to Orpheus, and that's how he views her. It's her decision. It's not him turning back to look at her. Here, it's her decision to reveal herself. It's, it's almost the same saying, come join me in death. It's not so bad. <laughs> and, and this, we talked about this in rehearsal about the politicalness of that act of removing your veil today. Think about present day Iran. You move your veil and you're making a political statement. Uh, and maybe you don't, you know you've taken your life in your hands too. Um, anyway, the rehearsal became a great place for discussing lots of difficult subjects. And uh, this was a scene that worked well. And then I, I think I'll just end here by playing the video of the, um, the symposium uh, creative panel, which gives you a few more uh, clips from the opera and will let you um, uh, have a sense of the, how dynamic this creative team was working together. This piece is a specific license to create an ensemble of artists where the total is greater than the sum of its parts. That is becoming clearer and clearer in the politics of 1791 in the societies of Europe in 1790s um, and of course in the opera. And we are not too distant from that now to recognize how the workers in each element have to be removed from some sort of hierarchy in order to be using their talents to their full extent. And in an opera about someone's voice, uh, it's crucial that our process does the same. Uh, 
I'm struck by how quickly the stance becomes one not of problem finding, where you're trying to discover interesting things to do and to say, but one of problem solving. <laughs> And the process of putting the orchestral and especially the instrumental side of this production together has certainly been that. We've had a lot of fun uh, in the vocal side, in the process of staging, doing uh, a lot of embellishment and a lot of improvisation. So that's been, in many ways, the, the challenge for us, just thinking on a very practical level about ways to get all the lines covered in this performance and to keep everything uh, to, to get all the notes that are in the score somehow into the <laughs> air this night, even if they're not played by the, the instruments that Haydn thought would play them. The liberties that I, that, that, that I see, especially with the score and how we bring that, that you know, what is written and animated and, and it becomes a full-blown scene um, is, is really interesting to me. People around me would notice that I'm backstage preparing for my next entrance, but then I'm writing something quickly because some, something just popped up in my head and I'm like, okay, I think I, I need to get that sentence down <laughs> right now. The experience has just been a whirlwind and I think um, you have done a spectacular job uh, in such a short time of being so concise, so precise, um, and bringing a very complex vision to life. It has been a real pleasure singing Jane Neal. I give Orpheus very specific rules, and I, I tell him exactly what he needs to do. I give him the laws of nature, and I tell him to follow them. And just like Deirdre was saying about hubris, he, he does follow me for a time. He follows nature. He's very much in tune with it in some aspects, in some ways, until his hubris gets the better of him. that some of these remarks and, and the kind of collective, positive, joyful energy that, that you're hearing this team share, um, I find that hugely encouraging. Here is this wonderful group of people who are, in fact, premiering a, a new old work. What an encouraging thought. I sort of expected last night that maybe Haydn would like take a bow mm -hmm. afterward. <laughs> because we had this lovely opportunity to see the freshness and energy that I associate with, with new work, with contemporary work. Limited rehearsal time, everybody pitching in, we're gonna make this show happen. And I think there's an, an energy that indie opera has understood for a long time, uh, but that is also shared in this world of historical performance. How beautiful that Haydn created this in 1791 and it's still important to us, it's still moving to us, it's still interesting for us, and it still brings us together. And one of the weird things that popped out the most to me, <laughs> one of the things of the story that popped out the most to me was um, Creante's call for war. And I know early on in January, Nico planted that seed with us of this idea of what kind of world um, where a father would call for war after his daughter dies. <laughs> There were a number of aspects for me that seemed to sort of um, signal a sort of omnipresent apocalypse that's sort of um, happening throughout. So, for example, I mean, the lighting, the absolutely just like visually stunning. It was this 
moment that was both incredibly beautiful to see, but also felt like unusually unearthly. And there's also plastic bags. I was obsessed with the plastic <laughs> bag last night, floating around, and I think they describe it as the gasping of an exhausted earth. There were so many different sonic aspects of the design, the voice of Pluto, the little ASMR crinkling on the microphone, the various odd, strange, unusual sounds that we hear throughout that are kind of hidden and kind of you guys. Um, and that's kind of what I was hearing is this sort of darkness of the earth in its existential throes, creaking and grieving and moaning and wailing. Stop that there and say thank you very, very much.